Romans 5.1 says that. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace in this passage means the end of hostility, not tranquility of mind. It's not that we have ceased to be hostile to God, but that God ceases to righteously be hostile toward us. Did you know that the Bible says that because of our sin, God has to be hostile to us? Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. This peace that Jesus brings changes the image of God from a fisted hand with a gavel to an outstretched hand of a friend. God's anger at us because of our sin is put away. Our separation from him is overcome. God adopts us into his family, and from now on, all his dealings with us are for good. He will never be against us. He becomes our father and our friend, and we don't need to be afraid anymore. The Prince of Peace is just one of 250 names given to the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. When he appeared for the first time on this earth in a manger in Bethlehem, the angels announced his arrival, as you remember, with these words, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The world into which Jesus was born had a very different idea of peace. Our English word peace originates from an old French word which means to be reconciled or to have an agreement with or to have the absence of hostility. But the Hebrew word shalom has a much richer meaning. That's the only Hebrew word I probably know to say out loud. Would you like to have the privilege of speaking Hebrew this morning? Let's say the word shalom out loud together. Shalom. This word is found 355 times in the Old Testament, and its basic meaning is to be whole or safe or sound. Shalom designates a condition in which life can best be lived. A review of shalom in the Old Testament reveals that it never refers to inner psychological or emotional peace. Shalom is the condition of everything being set right. It's about the total well-being of the person and the community. It's one of the deepest longings of the human heart. Say it again. Shalom. Jesus is the one who brings the deepest longings of our hearts for peace to satisfaction. But if we are honest, we can easily become discouraged when we see so little peace in our world and in our hearts. We long mostly for international peace, but Jesus, I believe, cares more about individual peace, internal peace. Yes, the world needs to come to peace, but how many of you know if peace comes to our hearts, pretty soon it comes to our culture. And so you start where you need to start, and that is with the importance of individual peace. So there are three major ways that we are affected by this peace which God brings. Let me explain them to you as we go along and we'll share them together. First of all, the Bible says that you and I can have peace with God. Underline the word with. Romans 5.1 says that. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace in this passage means the end of hostility, not tranquility of mind. It's not that we have ceased to be hostile to God, but that God ceases to righteously be hostile toward us. Did you know that the Bible says that because of our sin, God has to be hostile to us? Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. This peace that Jesus brings changes the image of God from a fisted hand with a gavel to an outstretched hand of a friend. God's anger at us because of our sin is put away. Our separation from him is overcome. God adopts us into his family, and from now on, all his dealings with us are for good. He will never be against us. He becomes our father and our friend, and we don't need to be afraid anymore. Peace with God was brought to us when Jesus Christ came down from heaven and went to the cross as the God-man 
and hung there between heaven and earth and paid the price for our sin, our sin which separated us from God. Jesus paid the price for all of it. He took it all away. And when we put our trust in him, we are forgiven and that sin is erased. And then we can have a relationship with God. Then we can say, therefore being justified by faith, I have peace with God. You have to start there before you can know the other kinds of peace that we're gonna talk about this morning. So let me just stop for a moment and say, if you've not made peace with God, it's not hard to do, but it means you have to make a decision. You have to decide to deal with your sin at the cross, give it all over to Jesus and ask him to forgive you. And when you do that and invite him to come and live in your heart, a relationship with God the Father is established immediately so that it is even possible, as the Lord God says, to come boldly before the throne of grace to receive help in the time of trouble. Wow. Then, of course, there's not only peace with God, but there's peace from God. John 14, 27 says, Jesus is saying, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus spoke these particular words on the verge of his violent execution. It was in the context of a stormy, difficult, unbelievable situation in his own life. Anyone can have peace when things are going well, when all is well at home, when physical health is at its zenith, when your financial problems are not too great, and when your children are halfway behaving. You can be at peace when everything's going well. And it is no credit to us when we have peace in those circumstances because the world has that kind of peace. But when we can have peace in the midst of difficult times, that is the testimony of the peace from God. And this peace is not just quiet tension. Some people think quiet tension is peace. It is just compressed anxiety. Too often we think that we are trusting when we're just controlling our panic. True peace is not only a calm exterior, true peace is a quiet heart. There's a wonderful moment that the Apostle John records in his gospel. Jesus is in a room making his first post-resurrection appearance to his gathered disciples. And then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, Jesus stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. It is what he did next that perfectly illustrates what we have been talking about in these last few verses. For the next verse in John chapter 20 says this, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. He was showing them his hands and his side, obviously for the purpose of identifying himself to them. But I believe he was also saying, these wounds are why I can say to you, Peace be with you. His death on the cross made it possible for him to offer us the peace we so desperately crave. But here's the best news of all. There's not only peace with God and the peace from God, but there's the peace of God. It's the best of all. We read about this in Philippians chapter 4. Here's what Paul wrote to the Philippian believers. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now watch this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. The peace of God acts, according to Paul, as a sentinel or a soldier who walks back and forth in the front of the door of your heart to provide security. The picture here is that our hearts and our minds are always under assault, Guilt, worries, threats, confusions, uncertainties, they all threaten our peace. And Paul says that God wants to guard our hearts and minds, and he guards our hearts with his peace when we commit ourselves to him. I like that picture of my heart and God's soldier walking back and forth in front of the door to keep all the junk out that would come in and destroy my peace. He guards our hearts in a way that goes beyond what human understanding can fathom. Philippians 4.9 tells us something even better, that while we have the peace of God guarding us 
from the outside, we actually have the God of peace protecting us from the inside. Verse 9 says, and the God of peace will be with you. If there's anything better than the peace of God, it has to be the God of peace. (laughs) Give me a choice. Do you want the peace of God or do you want the God of peace? I'll take the latter. (laughs) And the Bible says that the peace of God is guarding the outside of your heart, but the God of peace is in your heart, keeping you calm in the midst of stress. As we look back at the wonder of God's peace, I want to encourage you to cultivate that peace in your life. And there are four main highways upon which the peace of God travels. The Spirit of God, the Son of God, the Word of God, and prayer. I want to say just a few words about each one of them. First of all, peace in the Spirit of God. Did you know that when Jesus was teaching his disciples and telling them that he was going to have to go back to heaven, he told them that it was a good thing he was going back to heaven because when he was going to go back to heaven, he was going to send the Holy Spirit down to take his place. You say, well, how could the Holy Spirit be better than the Son of God in one way? When Jesus Christ was on this earth, he confined himself to the limitations of his human body so that Jesus was where he was while he was on this earth, only where he could be personally. And as you know the story of the Bible, Jesus really never left the land of Israel. But he said, when I go back to heaven, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit, and he will not be so confined. The Holy Spirit will come to live within the heart of every single person who puts their trust in me. Therefore, through the Holy Spirit, I will be available to you wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever happens to you. The Bible teaches us that when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within our hearts and becomes our perpetual, eternal Savior. John 16, 33, Jesus finished his speech to his disciples about his going back to heaven and said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. When you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, you have the possibility of peace in your life. And the Bible says that peace is the inevitable result of the Holy Spirit controlling your life. So how can I tell if I'm controlled by the Holy Spirit of God? By the quietness within me when there's turmoil around me. (laughs) How do I know if the Holy Spirit's working that peace in my life when I have some moments when everything should be coming unglued and I just feel this little little sense in my heart, I'm going to be okay. God is with me. I'm going to make it. That's what God says he will give to us through his spirit and then the peace of the Son of God when Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure from them he encouraged them with these words he said let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me peace I leave with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid just a few verses later Jesus expounded on his earlier promise He said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Now, to be honest with you, he said, in the world you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. I love this question that is tucked away in the book of Job. I never realized this was there. I've read the book of Job a lot of times, but this one escaped me. But it's worth writing down. Job 34, 29. When he gives quietness... Who then can make trouble? (laughs) Isn't that a great verse? If he, and this is obviously speaking of God, if he then brings quietness here, who's going to make trouble? Here's my prayer for all of us borrowed from the prayer Paul prayed for his friends in Thessalonica. Here's what he prayed. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. That's my prayer. Then there's peace in the Word of God. Did you know that the psalmist gives us in his book the longest chapter in the Bible? How many verses are in Psalm 119? I'm sure some of you know. 176. And one of the interesting things about Psalm 119 and the 176 verses is almost all of these verses, with the possible exception of one or two, almost all of these verses have a synonym in the verse for the Bible. So if you read this, it's all about the Word of God. And then the synonyms are like statutes and commandments and all of that sort of thing. But here's the interesting thing. Just 11 verses from the end of that psalm 
David writes this verse. Listen carefully. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing shall cause them to stumble. Did you know that of the 27 New Testament books, 18 of those books begin with a greeting of peace? And did you notice it's always grace and peace, not peace and grace, because you can't have peace till you get grace. (laughs) Grace is always first. There's no exception. Grace and peace. The book of Philippians starts like this. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace and peace from the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. In every instance, in every situation, peace is our promise from the Lord. Let us acquire the resolve of the psalmist when it comes to our response to the Word of God. He wrote in Psalm 85, 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. I will hear what God the Lord will have to say, because when I listen to him, he speaks peace. Did you know that the Bible is the key to your peace? That when you read the scriptures, God's peace jumps out at you. When I'm going through some times and I don't know what to do, I try to find a way to spend more time in the scripture. Not to prepare a sermon, but for my own help and encouragement. And once in a while, you guys, you should memorize a few verses from this book because they act as anti-terrorism agents in your life. So when bad stuff is happening and terror is going on, you know there's a verse someplace you can grab hold of and use it as a weapon against anxiety. And finally, there's peace and prayer. Listen to what Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 4. Be anxious for nothing, says the Scripture, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. Now, here's the way I sort that out in my mind. In essence, Paul says the Christian life is composed of three circles. First of all, there's the worry circle or the anxiety circle. And if you read the text, what belongs in that circle? Be anxious for what? Nothing. And then there's the prayer circle. And what should you pray about? What, what goes in the prayer circle? Everything. And then there's the thanksgiving circle. And what goes in that circle? Anything that God does for you, always be thankful. In the very act of being thankful for what God has done for you, he begins to dissipate the anxiety that's trying to hurt your heart. So in other words, we must be anxious for nothing, prayerful for everything, and thankful for anything. That's the kind of peace that never fails to produce that quiet center in your heart. Some years ago, I was given the opportunity to speak at the Moody Pastors Conference in Chicago. I spoke there on a Wednesday night, and I was supposed to come home the next day. There were a thousand pastors at this event, and what I most remember about my being there was not my message, but hearing those guys sing. Have you ever heard a thousand pastors sing? Oh my goodness, it's the most amazing thing you ever heard in your life. It kind of reminded me of the first day I went to chapel when I was a student at Dallas Seminary, and in this old stone chapel with walls that reverberated, I went in there for the first time, and the whole seminary of men stood up to sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It was an amazing experience. After I went back to my room that night, I decided to catch an earlier flight home the next day that was to leave at 7 a.m., As I was getting ready for bed, I began to calculate how early I would have to get up in order to make that flight. On my time, which was two hours earlier, I asked for a 2.30 wake-up call. I made it to the airport in plenty of time, and I went to my gate only to discover that my flight was delayed for an hour, which later became two hours. You, You guys know what that's all about. When I checked in, I asked the young lady at the desk if she knew what was going on with my flight. She said, there's a storm hovering over Chicago. Would you like to see it? I said, what do you mean? 
She said, well, come around here and I'll show you this storm on my computer screen. So I went around to the welcome desk and there on the screen of her computer, I could see the storm. Here was Chicago and surrounding it was this red mass. That red mass literally swallowed Chicago up on the screen. And we were right in the center of the storm. The storm was over the top of Chicago, so no planes could land and no planes could take off. Everything was shut down. So I went back, sat down in my comfortable chair, and began working on my computer. And for the next few moments, I watched as the storm I had seen on the computer rolled into the city of Chicago. I saw this ferocious storm the rain beating against the glass windows. You could actually see the windows moving with the pressure of the wind and the rain. I had a moment of clarity right then, a moment of truth. I was surrounded by a storm. In fact, I was sitting at the very center of that storm. But I was sitting in a comfortable chair with a cup of coffee in my hands, working on my computer, and I was just as safe as anybody could be. I was sheltered in the midst of the storm. And I remembered this psalm. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. For you have been a shelter for me. The Lord Jesus Christ has more than I can count sheltered me in the midst of personal storms. When I didn't know what was going to happen and the storm seemed almost unbearable down in the quiet place in my heart where no one can see but God himself, there was this quiet peace that was beyond my understanding and didn't seem rational because it wasn't it was supra-rational. It was the peace of God which passes all understanding. And that's the peace God wants you and me to have. That's his gift to us. He has bequeathed it to us and made it a legacy of the cross. And if you will receive him, first of all, you can have peace with God. But after you become a Christian, you can know the peace that comes from God. And most of all, you can learn how to accept the peace of God and the God of peace who lives within your heart. And you will be better. And in this crazy world, which seems to be spinning out of control, you will be the only stable thing in your whole neighborhood. <laughs> and people will look at you and say, what's wrong with him? Isn't he reading the news? Jesus is saying that you cannot use worry to accomplish your goal. It's futile to worry. And if you try it, all it will do is ruin your life and you will never accomplish anything with it. Worry is inconsistent. It's irrational. It's ineffective. Now in verse 28 and 30, it's illogical. Listen to this. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus perhaps was standing where the lilies of the field could be seen. And he says to them, look at these lilies. They don't even toil. They don't spin. And look how they are adorned. He says they're more beautiful than all of the beauty of Solomon, great kingly robes. And if your father in heaven would take such great care of the lilies of the field. Do you not think he cares about you? If God takes care of that which only has a short lifespan, they grow and then they're destroyed. Ladies and gentlemen, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're eternal. If God will take such great care of the temporal, don't you think he's gonna take great care of the eternal? Worry itself is a concern over the future. Worry is concern about something that we cannot do anything about, that we cannot even be sure about. One who worries looks off into the future, but the problem with the person who does that is twofold. First of all, the future is not here. 
And secondly, the future is not his. No one but God knows its true shape. And according to the Bible, worry is concern over the unknown and uncontrollable future. Remember the day Jesus met with Mary and Martha? If you want to know the poster child for worry in the New Testament, it had to be Martha. Jesus addressed her. He said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. And that is what describes so many of God's people today. We're worried and troubled about many things. Now let's get it straight. We live in a world that makes it very easy for us to worry. Can I get a witness? All this stuff that's going on in our country today and around the world, the diseases, the wars, all of it. If we allow ourselves, we can get consumed with worry about all of that. But when worry takes over in our lives, men and women, as Christians, it makes it very difficult for God's word to have any impact on us. In fact, when Jesus was teaching on the sowing of the sower and the seed, he said that sometimes when the word of God is sown in the hearts of people, it falls among thorns. And these thorns grow up and they choke the word of God out of the heart. And in detailing who those thorns are in Matthew chapter 13, one of them is the cares of this world. Jesus said when you get so caught up in the cares of this world, it will take you away from your ability to hear and understand and profit from the word of God. Chuck Swindoll says that worry pulls tomorrow's cloud over today's sunshine. So if there's one place in the Bible where you're going to find out what the Bible says about worry, it will be in this passage in Matthew chapter 6. Here Jesus uses the term worry six times and the expression don't worry three times. Here's the don't worry verses. Verse 25, chapter 6 of Matthew. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Matthew 6, 31. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Matthew 6, 34. Do not worry about tomorrow. So if you want to have the distilled teaching of Jesus on the subject of worry, it comes in two words. Don't worry. Now, before we deal with Jesus' thoughts on this, I want to tell you, first of all, what he is not saying. Some people read the old translation that deals with the subject of anxiety, and in the original King James Version, it says this, be careful for nothing. And I know a lot of people who live that way, don't you? They're careful for nothing. That was kind of my life first when I was a young person, you know, carefree. Jesus is not telling us when he says, don't worry, that we should never plan, that we should never be concerned about the future, that we should never be strategic in the way we live our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness planning what was going to happen next. He planned for the Last Supper. He tells us, don't ever enter into a project unless you count the cost. Jesus was a planner, so he's not talking about do away with all planning. You know, I know some preachers that live like that. You ask them, why don't you study? Well, I just open my mouth and the Bible says the Lord will fill it. Well, you can only try that two or three times on one congregation and you're working somewhere else. <laughs> you know, the, the, the problem with all of this thought about not taking this seriously is wrong. Jesus is not only not talking about not planning, he's not saying that we shouldn't have concerns. How many of you know it's right to have concerns? God has given to us the mechanism in our body so that when things happen, we're alerted. Adrenaline flows. We know what to do. Your child runs out into the street where there's traffic. You need to be concerned about that and go into action. But men and women, there's a great deal of difference between worry and concern. Worry sees problems. Concern solves problems. Worry lives in the unknown future. Concern lives in the present. And you need to understand the difference between those two. Jesus is a masterful teacher, so he's going to give us five things about worry that we need to know. These are so central to this subject that when I put the study Bible together that many of you have, I actually listed them in a sidebar so that they would always be next to this passage. I believe this is so critical to where we are today with so many people um, you know, in anxiety, even among God's people. So Jesus said, here's what you need to know about worry. Worry, first of all, the Lord Jesus said, is inconsistent. Read with me the 25th verse of the 6th chapter. Therefore, Jesus said, I say to you, 
Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The point is that God would not have given us life and he would not have created our bodies without seeing to the provision of those things that are necessary to sustain us. If you believe in a creator God, you also must believe in a sustainer God or you're not consistent. Jesus said, first of all, worry is inconsistent. If God has given you life and your body, he will help you with the other things that go with it. Now, secondly, Jesus said that worry is irrational. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? God Almighty provides for the birds. Don't you think he'll provide for you? Are you not much more valuable than the birds? Worry is inconsistent. And it's irrational. But here is the whole core of it. The middle point of the five is the key point. It's ineffective. It doesn't work. Worry never accomplished anything and it never will. The only thing it does is destroy the person who does it. And listen to what Jesus is saying in verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his statue? What Jesus is saying, why are you doing something that doesn't work? He's saying a cubit was 18 inches. He's saying you can't worry yourself into being 18 inches taller than you are. I'd be over seven foot by now. It's futile to worry. And if you try it, all it will do is ruin your life and you will never accomplish anything with it. Worry is inconsistent. It's irrational. It's ineffective. Now in verse 28 and 30, it's illogical. Listen to this. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus perhaps was standing where the lilies of the field could be seen. And he says to them, look at these lilies. They don't even toil. They don't spin. And look how they are adorned. He says they're more beautiful than all of the beauty of Solomon, great kingly robes. And if your father in heaven would take such great care of the lilies of the field, do you not think he cares about you? If God takes care of that which only has a short lifespan, they grow and then they're destroyed. Ladies and gentlemen, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're eternal. If God will take such great care of the temporal, don't you think he's going to take great care of the eternal? And finally, and this is kind of what you might call in your face grace here, this last one. This is really a hard one, but I have to share it to you because this is what Jesus said. Worry is irresponsible. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, but your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. Now, the word Gentile in the text is often translated by the word pagan. It's a reference to anybody who doesn't know God or doesn't follow God. Jesus' words are stunning. He says, when you worry, you act like a pagan. You act like somebody who doesn't know God. You act like you don't have a family and you don't have a father. You act like you're an orphan. This is what they do before they know God. Now you know God. Now you're a part of God's family. He's your father. You're in his family. So don't live like you don't have a father because you do. Don't act like you're an orphan because you're not. Let me just say something to you all because this is so profound and so simple. It is amazing to me how many of God's people go through the problems of life that create worry in their own hearts and never, ever tell God about their problems. I think some Christians are embarrassed to go before the throne in heaven and say, Lord God, I'm having a real struggle here and I need your help. 
I believe if you read the Psalms of the Old Testament, you'll see David pouring out his heart to God in every imaginable situation you can come up with. And they aren't uh, veiled prayers. They're not nice prayers. They're gut level prayers. Lord God, I need help. So let me just suggest to you, you have a father in heaven. You have a family on earth. Both of them are created to be helpful to you. And don't try to do all this by yourself, by worrying, because it's going to get you nowhere. You're in the family. Ask yourself who you are. Step up and be counted as a child of God. So that's Jesus' take on worry. That's given to us to help us understand it. Remember, it's inconsistent, it's irrational, it's ineffective, it's illogical, and it's irresponsible. And that's why Jesus says, don't do it. But now, in a loving way, he helps us not only to understand worry, but he gives us a couple of things to help us overcome worry. This is really the core of what I want to say to you today. First thing he says is commit your life totally to Jesus Christ, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the word at the beginning of the verse needs something before it. So it would read like this. Don't worry, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You get up in the morning and say, Lord, this day is yours. My children are yours. My wife is yours. My ministry is yours. My health is yours and you give it to God. But you see, if you give it to God, you can't keep reaching in and taking it back. You give it to God and say, I'm gonna trust you with it, and the next thing you know, you're worrying about it. What you've done is taken it back from God. No, Jesus is absolutely right. He says, commit your way to the Lord. Give him everything and trust him with it. I remember hearing about a businessman who's going through some rough times in his business, and he was a worrier. And he was keeping up at night, and he was getting ulcers, and he he wasn't gonna make it. If something didn't happen, it was just burning him out. One day he walked into his office at work and as he walked in, something hit him. He saw his desk and behind the desk, the big chair that he sat in during the day. And he paused in front of that desk and he said, Lord God, you sit in that chair. You be the CEO of this company. You call the shots today, I'm giving it all to you. And he visualized in his mind, the Lord Jesus Christ sitting at the chair of the CEO in his company. In essence, that's what we all have to do. Who is seated on the throne of your life? It's either you or God. If it's you, you're gonna worry a lot. But if you can learn how, over the long haul, to put your life in the hands of Almighty God, that's the first step. That's the long view. Now, Jesus is gonna add to that what we might call the short view. And the short view, tells you to concentrate your energies on living one day at a time. Notice verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Every day we have in life is going to come with some adversity, some things designed that will make us anxious. So in order to avoid being overwhelmed, Jesus says we need to teach ourselves how to live in daytight compartments. <laughs> live every day unto itself. Because if you start living tomorrow, it's not going to work. What does it mean to worry about other things than the things that happen today? Well, do you know some people I know, they, they dwell on all their tomorrows. There's a powerful verse in the scripture in the Old Testament that I've sort of claimed as a verse for me. And here's what it says. Deuteronomy 33, 25, as your days, so shall your strength be. Now, there's probably some other ways to interpret that, but here's what I get from that. As your days, so your strength will be. So don't dwell on your tomorrows. And don't dwell on your yesterdays. Oh, how many people ruin their lives with a faulty yesterday. When you look over your shoulders and you begin to dwell on the yesterdays of your life, you will usually settle down on one of three things. You will worry about your sins that you committed, which is crazy because God's already promised that if you ask him to forgive you, he puts them as far as the east is from the west and removes your transgressions from you. Psalm 103 verse 12. The Bible says he buries them in the deepest sea, puts a sign up outside that says no fishing here. So don't worry about yesterday's sins if they're forgiven. And don't worry about yesterday's successes. I know a lot of people who've had a great deal of success in the past, and it isn't being replicated in the present, so they worry about yesterday's successes. 
Don't do that. And then some people never get over yesterday's sorrows, and I say this delicately, but I want to say it. I think if you lose your husband, there's a proper time to mourn him in sorrow. I'm not trying to be indelicate about this. But Almighty God left you on this earth not to be a sorrower. He left you on this earth to serve him, and you need to do what you do to mourn the loss of a loved one, however that is, and then draw a line in the sand and say, it's time for me to get on with my life and serve God because he left me here for a purpose. I promise you that's what your spouse would want you to do. So you can't live in yesterday's sorrows. You can't live in yesterday's successes, and you can't live in yesterday's sins. you got to live today in this day. I have a little thing that I wrote down. I keep close at hand. I know I've shared this with you before, but it's worth repeating. One would-be worrier pictured it this way. I was regretting the past and fearing the future, and suddenly my Lord was speaking. My name is I Am. He paused, and I waited. He continued, when you live in the past with its mistakes and regrets, it is hard, for I am not there. My name is not I was. When you live in the future with its problems and fears, it is hard because my name is not I will be. But when you live in this moment, it is not hard, for I am here. My name is I am. Jesus is telling us to focus our concern on today, to put our concerns, efforts, and energies in all that we have into this day. This is the key that will lock the door on worry and open the door to peace Focus your concern upon this day. Give this day to the Lord. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And your strength will be sufficient for each day. Sufficient unto the day are the strength that God gives you. I've lived many weeks when I didn't know how I was going to make it through Monday, but I did. And then Tuesday came and my energy was replenished and I was able. And by the time I got to Thursday or Friday, I was living on the top of the mountain. We don't ever want to assess how things are going to be three or four days from now based on how we feel today. Just live your day, give God the glory, and the next day you will be fine. I read about a pastor who was on a long cross-country flight when the first sign of problems began to flash. All of us have experienced this. Fasten your seat belts. Then a few seconds later, a calm voice said, we won't be serving the beverages at this time. We're expecting a little turbulence. Be sure your seat belts are fastened. And then the storm broke. Cracks of thunder could be heard even above the roar of the engines. Lightning lit up the darkening skies, and within moments the plane was like a cork being tossed around on a heavenly ocean. One moment the airplane was lifted up on the currents, and the next moment it dropped as if it was going to crash to the earth. The pastor confessed that he shared the worry and fear of those around him. He said, I looked around the plane. I saw that a lot of passengers were upset. Some were crying. Many were praying. He said, then I saw a little girl. She had tucked her feet beneath her as she sat on her seat, and she was reading a book. Everything around her was going crazy, and there she sat with her little small world, calm and orderly. Sometimes she would close her eyes, and then she would read again. And then she would straighten her legs, but worry and fear weren't in her at all. So the pastor couldn't believe it. He couldn't figure this out, and he decided to figure it out himself. So he waited until the plane landed, and when it got to its destination, he waited in the area outside of the, of the gate, and all the passengers were hurrying to disembark. And he asked the little girl if he could speak to her for a moment, and he asked her why she had not been worried while she was in the midst of the storm. And the little girl said, because my daddy is the pilot, <laughs> and he's taken me home. And she was in perfect peace because she knew her father was trustworthy, and she wasn't worried at all. Recently in our church, we had the funeral for a woman who was tragically killed in an accident on our campus. I'll never forget, her husband gave a word in the service, very unusual. And he said at the end of his speech that people had asked him many times how he was dealing with this, and he paused for a moment and he just said, I trust in God. 
in the midst of all that we face. Isn't that it? And that, I am sure, is why we have this wonderful verse from Isaiah. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. In the midst of our storm, we need to look up and notice that the cockpit is occupied and Almighty God is in control and we can rest secure in Him. This ship we're on is rocking right now with all the stuff that's happening in the world, but we can learn to have that quiet peace that the little girl had if we'll put our trust in the Lord. Every week when I stand here in front of an empty auditorium and preach to more people than I ever have before in my life, I'm reminded of the incredible opportunity that God has given me to share the wonderful message of the gospel with those who watch and listen. And I just want to let you know the one thing that's burning in my heart more than anything else is that if you are watching and you do not know Jesus Christ in a personal way, before we're finished uh, with our service, you will accept him and allow him to fill you with his presence and his guidance and his friendship and his salvation during this time. I want to talk with you in this message about the perfect storm. When the Andrea Gale left Gloucester Harbor in Massachusetts on September the 20th, 1991, and headed into the North Atlantic, no one could have known that this fishing boat would never be seen again. Only a bit of debris ever turned up and the six crew members vanished forever. In his book, The Perfect Storm, author Sebastian Junger immortalized the fate of the Andrea Gale. A film followed featuring George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg but these stars, big as they are, played only supporting roles. The real star of the film was the storm itself, a terrifying, relentless oppressor born of fierce winds and mountainous waves. It was meteorologists who named this cataclysmic tempest the perfect storm. It is just a way of saying worst case scenario. In the case of the Andrea Gale, it was the simultaneous convergence of the toughest weather conditions possible. Three deadly elements came together in October of 1991. First of all, there was a front moving from Canada toward New England and a high pressure system building over Canada's east coast and the dying remnants of Hurricane Grace, all of them churning along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Strong weather was coming from three of the four points on the compass and all of it converging on the little Andrea Gale. The last radio transmission of Billy Tyne, the captain of the fishing boat, came at 6 p.m. on October 28, 1991. He reported his coordinates to the captain of his sister ship, the Hannah Bowden, saying, she's coming on, boys, and she's coming on strong. The popular book and the movie brought the term perfect storm into common use. But the concept is as old as humanity. People have always had to deal with the convergence of multiple rough circumstances. Today, in our faster, more crowded, and more complex world, a few little squalls can quickly become the perfect storm. And when multiple conditions converge and threaten critical areas of our lives, such as finances, relationships, jobs, and health, we question how much more we can endure. There is really no better term available to describe what we're going through right now. This is the ultimate perfect storm. We are in the midst of this storm, and it's very hard not to feel the clutches of fear that accompany us serious storms. The fate of the Andrea Gale demonstrates two kinds of fear that we all experience. The first is that gut-level adrenaline-drenched fear that the crew felt in the midst of the storm. They were afraid because their lives were on the line. This kind of fear is beneficial. It's, it's a necessary instinct for survival. 
But there's another kind of fear that can immobilize us completely, and that's the fear of fear itself. Fear in the midst of the storm is instinctive and beneficial. Fear of a storm that could happen is not. It's like the fear educator William Hughes expressed in his poem. Last night I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. We need a perspective on life that takes into account the perfect storms, but also reassures us that there's a safe harbor within reach. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. As we follow him, as we, as we become his disciples, our troubles look different in the light of his goodness and his power and his wisdom. What do you do? What, what do we do when the perfect storm comes into our life? How do we manage when the winds of ill fate blow against us? Here, from the life of Jesus, is a perfect storm experience that will help us understand how we can deal with the storm we are facing right now. Our lesson begins with the probability of storms in our life, and our passage is in the book of Mark and the fourth chapter. When evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side, and now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Uh, it is evening, and Jesus and his disciples are exhausted after a full day of ministry. Jesus' decision to cross from Capernaum to the other side of the Sea of Galilee is the only way he and his disciples can get away from the crowds. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was near exhaustion, and his 12 disciples were reeling from the rigorous training he'd been giving to them. The crowds had been overwhelming. Sick people, craving his healing touch, had flocked to Jesus on every street. Now Jesus was speaking near the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The crowds had begun to press in so hard that he was almost shoved back into the water, and he climbed into a boat and pushed out a few feet, and he sat down and continued teaching, according to the verse, verse 1 of Mark chapter 4. And by the time he had finished, it was evening. Desperately needing rest, Jesus and the disciples simply remained in the boat and set sail for the eastern shore, where Jesus was to minister the next day. The elements of a perfect storm were gathering. I've been to Israel many times, and I can tell you from my own experience that the Sea of Galilee is like a bowl of water nestled nearly 700 feet below sea level. Mountains surround nearly every side of the sea, forming a valley and gullies that set the stage for howling winds and when the cool air from the mountains swoops through the valleys and collides with the warm, moist air hovering over the sea, violent storms can erupt in a matter of minutes. And that's just what happened. Mark 4.37 says, A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. The great windstorm, which arose on this particular day, could be described as a furious squall. Mark, in his gospel, uses a Greek word for the windstorm that is often translated hurricane. And Matthew describes the storm as a great seismos, or earthquake, like there was an earthquake in the middle of the lake and the shaking of the winds and, and the boat. This storm was so violent that the waves were breaking over the boat in which Jesus was with his disciples, and it was filling it up with water. And while the boat was filling with water, the hearts of the disciples were also filling up with fear. Just as sudden storms are inevitable on the Sea of Galilee, men and women, sudden storms can descend on our lives too. The coronavirus is our sudden storm. One day the sea was calm and we awoke on the next day and we were in the biggest storm any of us have ever experienced. The probability of storms in our lives. Let's notice, secondly, the paradox of storms in our lives. Here's an interesting thought from this story. At this time in their lives, the disciples were just following Jesus wherever he went, yet here they are being tossed up and down by a storm and in danger of drowning. 
They were in the middle of God's perfect will, and they were in the middle of a perfect storm all at the same time. They were about to learn a priceless lesson, and that is that storms are not always a punishment for lack of obedience. Sometimes they are the result of obedience. The disciples were not in the storm because they had done something wrong. They were in the storm because they were just doing something right. Those men were there because they had jumped in the boat when Jesus said, let's go. So there's a paradox here. Well, they didn't do anything wrong. They're in the midst of a storm. And some people would say, how does that work? So you see the probability of storms in our lives and the paradox of storms in our lives. Let's notice third, the presence in the storms of our lives. Mark 4.38 says this, but Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow and they awoke him and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The disciples, you see, had yet to learn who Jesus was. If they had realized the full power and authority that Jesus held, they would have laughed and shouted at the wind. In the midst of the storm, there was a presence. Some people believe in the power of God, but they're not sure about the presence of God. This was the crisis the disciples faced. They knew that Jesus was there, but apparently they still didn't realize that he was God. This meant they were unaware of God's presence. So they didn't know what Jesus could and would do. They knew that God could take control over the winds and the seas, but they had not yet come to believe that Jesus was God. Remember, the 12 knew the story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. They knew that God could take control over the winds and the seas, but was that same God with them here and now? That was their question. They did not yet realize that Moses' God and their master were one and the same, and they truly had Emmanuel, God, with us in the boat where the storm had captured them. Incidentally, this is the only time in the Bible where we are told that Jesus slept, and he did it in the midst of a fierce storm. So that night on the Sea of Galilee, an exhausted Jesus slept on a cushion in the rear of the boat, with the waves crashing all about him and his disciples in despair for their lives. So we have the probability of storms in our lives and the paradox of storms in our lives and the presence in the storms of our lives, and now we come to the peace in the storms of our lives. Verse 39 says this, Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Mark tells us that Jesus rebuked the wind just as a parent would rebuke an unruly child. He dealt with demons in the same way when he rebuked them, and the wind obeyed him just as the demons did. This incredible display of miraculous power should have quelled any remaining doubts in the minds of the disciples as to who Jesus was. I mean, the Old Testament tells us that only God has power over nature, Psalm 89, verse 9 says, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 107 and verse 29 says, He calms the storm so that its waves are still. And that's what Jesus did in this storm. He, he first brought peace to the circumstances around his disciples before he calmed their hearts. There was a calm around the disciples before there was a stillness inside the disciples. Aren't you thankful for the moments when he stills the storm and chaos around you while your emotions are running high? Our loving Heavenly Father is kind and patient with us when the storms of life overwhelm us and fill us with anxiety. We've experienced some of that in recent days. He's gracious to show us his power even when we're beginning to wonder if he's asleep or absent, even when our cries to him for help are permeated with doubt. But we can face whatever circumstances await us with courage if we just reflect on his faithfulness and place our confidence in his great power and loving purpose for our lives. Remember, men and women, that peace is not the absence of stress. Peace is the presence of the Savior. So you have the probability of storms in your life and the paradox of storms in your life. 
and the presence of storms in your life and the peace in the storms in your life. But let's notice number five, the purpose of storms in our lives. And let's ask the question that's in the back of many of our minds. Did Jesus bring about this storm just so he could calm it and build his disciples' faith? No, no, he didn't do that. He had no need to create new storms to demonstrate his true nature because this fallen world stirs up enough storms without him having to do it specially. <laughs> he builds our faith by using the storms that are already there. So I see no reason to believe that Jesus went to sleep for any other purpose than catch some much needed rest. Yet he was quick to use the storm, wasn't he? As a teachable moment. The storm brought him their full attention, even as the coronavirus has brought us to attention. And the lesson would never be forgotten by those disciples, as I hope it will not soon be forgotten by us. Since we are human beings, I think I'm safe in saying that we have no shortage of storms in our lives. Not just the storm, the big one that we're going through now, but we live in a fallen world, and trouble of some kind is woven into the fabric of life. Until these storms hit, we live with the delusions of adequacy. But storms cut us down to size and cause us to fear what we cannot control. And although God does not create the storm in our life, he uses the churning seas to demonstrate his power and strengthen our faith in him. I'm a real fan of C.S. Lewis. He has a way of saying things that really help me understand. And this is what he said. He said, God, who has made us, knows what we are and that our happiness lies in him. Yet we will not seek it in him as long as he leaves us any other resort where it can even plausibly be looked for. While what we call our own life remains agreeable, we will not surrender it to him. What then can God do in our interest but make our own life less agreeable to us and take away the plausible sources of false happiness? I have to honestly tell you that what's going on for many of us now is we're sequestered and can't go anywhere and do what we normally do. Uh, we have found our life less agreeable, have we not? But if we pause for a moment and take a step back, if we examine what's really going on, we will discover what David the psalmist discovered, and that's the value of the storms God allows. In Psalm 119 and verse 67, David said it this way, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Once again, in Psalm 119, verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. David said, God used the afflictions, the storms in my life to bring me back to a relationship with him. He said, before this happened, I was going astray. And maybe some of you would have to say the same thing. You know, it's so easy to get comfortable with our faith and then allow our faith to be pushed to the circumference of life. We go on with the busyness of our work and our family and our enjoyments and our sports and all the things that are a part of us. And all of a sudden, the God who desires to be the center of our life is barely on the circumference of our life. And like David, we'll go through something like this. And if we're careful, if we listen to our heart, if we're sensitive to what God is doing, we'll discover what David discovered. Before the storm, we went astray, but now we have come back to fellowship with God. I hope that is true for many of you. I've heard from some of you that that is what's happening. So Jesus allowed the winds to rage in order that his disciples would learn to trust him. And through the storms of life, our Lord teaches us many precious lessons. He reminds us of our own human emptiness, our own total dependence upon him. He teaches us to fear God with astonished reverence, not to fear the storms. We're almost finished, but there's still a couple of points left. The probability of storms in our lives. The paradox of storms in our lives. The presence in the storms of our lives. The peace in the storms of our lives, the purpose of storms in our lives, and the product of storms in our lives. Once again, Mark chapter 4 and verse 40. Jesus said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? 
Now, please notice, Jesus was a lot gentler with the disciples than he was with the wind. When he rebuked the wind, he only asked his disciples two questions. Why are you so fearful, and how is it that you have no faith? With these questions, Jesus reveals a spiritual truth, and that is that the opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is fear. Belief breeds confidence, while unbelief breeds fear. Essentially, Jesus was saying, why are you afraid? Do you not yet trust God whose power is present in me? In the book of 1 Kings tells us about the prophet Elijah who challenged the prophets of Baal to a duel of faith on top of Mount Carmel. From morning until noon, the prophets of Baal called upon their God to send down fire and consume the sacrifice on the altar, but nothing happened, not even a flicker. And Elijah mocked them with stinging sarcasm. In 1 Kings 18, 27, he says this, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. The disciples apparently assumed that Jesus was just as indifferent to their plight, so they cried, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Elijah's suggestion that Baal might have been asleep is precisely the complaint the disciples leveled at Jesus. You're sleeping, and we're drowning. Please, wake up. But there's a specific fear that may be claiming your attention. Whatever that fear is, it will only be amplified by failure to trust in God. He is not sleeping. He is here. He knows every thought in your mind and in mine, every feeling in our hearts. And while I stare with fear at the dark skies, he focuses on the person he is forming me to be. He sees those storms as growing pains, part of the formation process. He knows that a storm may be the very thing that awakens me to deep faith in him. And what really intrigues me about this account is that Jesus replaced the disciples' fear with more fear. After staring in awe at the suddenly calm and windless sea, the Bible says they feared exceedingly. And they said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Several Bible translations say they were terrified they suddenly realized they were in the presence of a power they had never imagined could be in a person, and the power was mightier than the violence of a stormy sea. Matthew tells us that in their awe they asked, what kind of man is this? Not what kind of God is this? They were still focused on his humanity, and although they were beginning to realize that he was something more than mere flesh and blood, it never entered their heads that Jesus actually created the Sea of Galilee and that the wind and waters were his. The disciples no longer worried about drowning. Now they were in awe of Jesus, and they felt a new sense of security in him. Debilitating fears were being replaced with the empowering fear of God, whom they dimly began to realize was with them in the presence of Jesus. The prob probability of storms, the paradox of storms, the presence of the storms, the peace in the storm, the purpose of the storm, the product of the storm, and the promises for the storms in our lives. As we review this story, which is familiar to most of us if we're readers of the Bible, we know the story. We know the story of Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat. But here are some takeaways from this story that are meant to help you and me as we negotiate our stormy time right now. First of all, God's Word alerts us to expect stormy seas. Men and women, the New Testament is salted with warnings about the stormy seas we face as followers of Jesus Christ. James writes in his book, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Peter writes in his book, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Jesus gave us the key to surviving storms in his story about two houses. Do you remember that? One built on the sand and the other on the rock. The sand represents the shallow, shifting, and unreliable values of worldly culture, and the rock represents the unshakable truth of God. 
As the storm rages, the first house quickly topples into the sand and washes out to sea, and the other stands firm, withstanding the force of the most violent winds. In decades of ministry, I have often seen the truth of this parable vividly demonstrated. People who place their trust in God withstand every storm because they have built their lives on the only foundation that cannot be moved. And people who do not do that crumble when the storms come. Let me just tell you, you shouldn't be surprised when storms come into your life because God told us it would happen. His Word alerts us to expect stormy seas. Secondly, God's Word announces that the Savior is on board. The disciples were too inexperienced with Jesus to have a faith devoid of fear. Perhaps you're the same way. You identify with Christ, but you draw no assurance as the clouds roll in and as the storm, the coronavirus storm continues. When the sky darkens, you might wonder whether you should step into the boat with Jesus or stay ashore in hopes of avoiding the storm. The problem with that choice is that it's a false one. You can't run. You can't hide. The storms will find you. You don't get to decide whether the rain is coming. You only get to decide whether to carry an umbrella. But he is sleeping, you say. He doesn't care. Don't let his seeming silence lead you to conclude that he isn't with you. Jesus says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And in Matthew 28, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Those are promises, and he has yet to break a promise. That he will be with you is the most certain fact of your life. What's uncertain is your grasp of that fact and your ability to trust and build your house upon that truth. It's the only stormproof foundation in existence. And sometimes the rains will pound hard to drown out all other voices, and we struggle to hear Christ. But that doesn't mean he isn't calming the storm. The storms pass, as they did for these two Christians, and we hear the voice of God once again, this time through, a new wisdom tempered by our struggles. And we realize that he was there all the time. God's word alerts us to expect stormy seas. God's word announces that the Savior is on board. And God's word affirms that faith drives out fear. When the terrified disciples awoke Jesus in the midst of the storm, he asked two critical questions. He said, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? And when the disciples stepped into the boat, they didn't trust in Jesus so that their fear escalated to terror when the storm came. But when Jesus awoke and calmed the storm, the dawning realization of who he really was ratcheted their faith to a whole new level. Later we learned that they became utterly fearless, proclaiming the truth of the kingdom in the face of all kinds of storms. Had they possessed mature faith that day in the boat, they could have curled up and napped with Jesus with no regard of the storm raging about them. They needed to understand that fear is dispelled only by faith. And then God's word alerts us to expect storms. God's word announces that the Savior's on board. And God's word affirms that faith drives out fear. And number four, God's word assures us of a safe landing. Notice what Jesus said to the disciples as they began their journey. In Mark 4:35, he said, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now consider what the text says about the end of the journey. Mark chapter five and verse one says, and they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. God's word assures us of a safe landing. We will make it to the other side. Jesus had said, let us cross over to the other side. And Jesus names a destination. It was certain they would reach it. Could there be a storm? Certainly. Would it be comfortable always on the voyage? No assurance of that. The disciples could have worried about ceasing this, but they didn't need to worry about drowning because Jesus had told them where they were going. Will there be storms along the journey? Certainly. Will our voyage be comfortable? We're learning right now that it's not comfortable all the time. No assurance that we will ever have a completely comfortable life. We might have to worry about seasickness, but what I'm here to tell you is you don't need to worry about drowning. 
We will get through the storms in our lives, and we will arrive where Jesus is taking us. Let me say it again. If Jesus says we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. Our Lord is with us, and we will not be abandoned by him in our time of need. So as we wrap all of this up, here is the key question that I alluded to at the beginning. Is Jesus in your boat? Or better yet, is Jesus in your heart and in your life? The disciples wouldn't have made it without the presence of Jesus, and I'm pretty convinced that we're not going to make it, you're not going to make it with victory without Jesus in your life. The storm was meant to get your attention. This storm we're in was meant to help you understand how desperately you need God because only God is, is worthy of trust in such an untrust time. So let me ask you again, is, is Jesus in your boat? Is he in your heart? Have you ever accepted him as your personal savior? And I want to ask you right now to do that if you've never done it before. I want to ask you to invite Jesus Christ into your life, into your storms, into the troubles that you are going through right now, into all of your questions and wondering about jobs and money and, and food and all of the rest of it. Invite Jesus Christ into the middle of it. Invite him into your heart. And here's how you do that. You pray a prayer, and through that prayer, you make that invitation. So let me lead you in that prayer. Let me help you pray that prayer. Pray this prayer after me. Dear God, I need your presence in my life. I need your Son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior and Lord. In the midst of all of this confusion, in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the wondering about the future, at this moment in time in my life, I invite Jesus Christ to be the captain of my soul. I invite him to come into my life and take his position on the throne of my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Make me a new person. Make me a new creature. Forgive me of my sin. And I will seek to serve you going forward. And Father, I want to thank you that wherever that prayer is prayed, you have heard it and answered it. Because in your book, you say you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you for those who prayed this prayer. Give them the courage to follow through on what they have done, that this won't be a whim or a moment or an emotional response, but a deep-seated decision that will change their lives forever. And we'll give you the praise for what you're going to do in each heart today. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And if you made that decision to put your trust in Christ, for many of you, as you're watching uh, on the Internet, uh, on your computer, there's a place on the screen where you can check that you have made the decision to put your trust in Christ. Please check that. And if you will give us information, we will send you some material that will help you grow. We have a little booklet called Your Greatest Turning Point that outlines some steps that you can take that will help you grow in your relationship with Christ. The booklet is absolutely free, and all you have to do is ask for it, and we'll send it to you. My prayer is for you that you will trust in God in the midst of this storm and find what we always find, that he is sufficient, that he loves us, and he loves us with an incredible love, and he will